Well, good morning, church. Um, as you've heard, my name is Caitlin Clementson, and I have been a member here at New Horizons Four Square Church for as long as I can remember. I grew up in this church. And so on my paper I have written that I'm so excited to share with you guys, but I want to be honest, I am very, very nervous. <laughs> but I, I actually, believe it or not, I have a very big fear of public speaking. Um, it's not really my thing, but Jesus has called me to it. And I think that's crazy how that works. But I, it's a lot easier to speak for Jesus than to speak for myself. So I'm excited to be up here and share with you guys today. And so I'm getting the opportunity to jump into our Genesis series. It's been going on for the past seven weeks. Um, but I'm going to dig into Genesis 25 through 32. Um, and that is the story of Jacob. But before we jump into that, let me catch up on speed on how we got here. Quickly through seven weeks. So Austin starts us in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. God creates the world and everything around us, and then he creates us in his image. He, he anoints us to be the living reflection of him, the rulers of his world. And I think that's a pretty big honor, but as we continue on through the book of Genesis, we see that we're not very good at that. <laughs> we continue to mess that up, and we continue to just do this spiral of sin. And so then we jump into some poems that explain to us the consequences of Adam and Eve eating the one fruit that they're not allowed to eat and deciding to decipher good and evil for themselves. We learn the consequences of that, and then we jump into the story of Cain and Abel, where it shows the consequences play out in lives, and it goes on through generations. We get so deep into this sin pattern that God decides he's starting new. So he sends the flood, and he, it's Noah and his family and all the animals on this ark, and he starts fresh. But humans don't last very long being good. And so we create the city of Babylon just a few generations after Noah's Ark. And we create it as a rebellion against God. We're, we're attempting to make our name great. Greater than him and above him. And so then God scatters the people of Babylon. Once again, trying to make the world the way he wants it. And so then we shifted from a general overview of humans last week into the story of Abraham. That's actually what we went over last week. Um, and God, and we just zoom in on this family. And we see how God blesses Abraham to be a blessing for generations and generations to come. God calls him and says, I will make you a great nation. And Austin went over that wonderfully. And we see all the trial and error in Abraham's story. The failure and then repentance. It's a mixed bag. You never know what's coming. But then he gives birth to a few sons, and one of these sons are Isaac. And that's actually where we're going to pick up on this story. So if you stay caught up over the five minutes of seven weeks, um, I would like to start us in prayer, and then we'll jump in to Genesis. So, dear Heavenly Father, we just welcome you in this place. We pray that your spirit just falls heavy on us. We pray that we have ears open to hear and hearts ready for you. We are ready to receive your word. We know your word is alive and your word is not dead. We are excited to see what you present to us. And we just pray with open hearts and open minds that you fill us. We pray against any distractions that might be hindering us from listening to your word or understanding what you're trying to do in our lives right now. And so we just praise you, we call you holy, and as a church family, we all say amen. amen. All right. So to start this message, we're actually going to jump straight into the word. We're going to go Genesis 25, 19 through 26, and I be. And so this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac when Isaac was 40 years old. He married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Armin from Padan Aram, and his sister of Laban, the Armin. 
Isaac prayed to the Lord for his, on behalf of his wife. So that because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. The babies fought within each other and said, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was hairy, and so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hands grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. All right, let's break that down. Right in the beginning, we can see the faithfulness of our God. He blesses them with children after being unable to get pregnant. So right from the beginning, both these boys are a blessing. They are a blessing. So that we can also see the tension and trouble rise right from the beginning because this is the thought within her mother. And then God also says, two nations are in your room. One will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. And now that might seem odd, but I think what we need to understand to get a grasp of what God is trying to say is that it is common belief that the firstborn child would be blessed. It's the firstborn right to get the blessing. And so when God comes in and he says, the older will serve the younger, it means that he is to be blessed. Jacob, the younger, is to be blessed. And it's painted from the very beginning that he is to be blessed. But then we instantly see this image of Jacob grabbing Esau's heel. And grabbing this heel is a sign, it's deceitful. It's grabbing such a critical, such a, a vulnerable place in his brother's body. And he's just grabbing that. Once again, from the very beginning, trying to steal a blessing that's his. He's trying to get that firstborn right. He's trying to get that firstborn blessing without trusting God when God said that it is his. And so it just it sets up a theme for the rest of Jacob's life, which is fulfilling his name of the deceiver or the heel grabber. And then we continue on from there, and we see Jacob once again trying to steal the blessing. You're going to see it multiple times in this story. And, and this happens when he's out and he's cooking some soup. And his brother Esau comes in and says, Brother, I'm famished. Can I have some soup? Jacob goes, Yeah, if you give me your firstborn right. He said, You can only have some of my soup if you get my firstborn right. If you give me your firstborn right. And so, quickly, Esau kind of gives that away. And so that's something that I, I thought was crazy. It's not the main part of the story, but I thought it was something I could point out. Was he just kind of said, okay, you can have it. I need some soup, which I don't know if I'd make that trade. But he did. And so, but I think it's crazy because once again, Jacob is deceiving. And he is lying. And he's trying to steal a blessing that is already his. He's trying to take something that is freely given to him. And so it's causing this disconnect. And I told you before that that's going to be the reoccurring theme in Jacob's life. But I think it's a constant reoccurring theme in all of our lives. I think we often find ourselves trying to take what we think we deserve. What we think we earned. We said we worked hard for it. We earned it. And we don't trust a God who's never been untrustworthy. We're not putting our faith in a God who's never been unfaithful. And it's what Jacob does continually, and it's what we often find ourselves doing. But I think, I think in this theme, we continue on, 
through, through everything in our lives, but also in Jacob's lives. And we see it in the main, one of the main things of the story is when Jacob actually steals the blessing that was his. Not just the firstborn, right? But the blessing. The blessing that God wanted to give them. He actually steals it. And so to understand where we're going to jump into scripture, I'm going to give you a little, little pre preface. We're going to, so basically, Isaac is going blind, which is his father who is going to bless. And he is close to the end of his life, so he is ready to give his blessing away. And so he calls his son Esau in and says, go hunt, prepare me some food, bring it back to me, and I will bless you. But Rebecca hears this. And Rebecca knows that Jacob is supposed to be blessed. So she instantly runs over to Jacob and says, go get some food, make it, serve it to your father, and get this blessing. She schemes this plan with Jacob. And Jacob, he actually, this is kind of the first time we saw this, a little, it feels a little out of character for Jacob, but he says, no, that's not right. Because I will get cursed. I will not get that blessing. If I am stealing a blessing, I shall be cursed. But Rebecca says, no, son, I will take that curse. I will take anything that falls on you. Just, just go get your blessing. Go get what is rightfully yours, she says. And so, kind of backtracking into that, Rebecca says she'll take that curse. And I think we, the way I interpret it is we see her live this out because she is the only person who played the role that she does that we never hear how she dies. We never actually, we never hear of her again. After, after Jacob leaves, we never hear of her again. And so I think it's, it truly shows that God did put a curse on it. But, but I think Rebecca just had this mindset of, well, if, if he does this, it's, it's the right thing. He's supposed to get blessed. So any actions from Jacob should be justified, right? So I think that was the mindset that she came into. Um, but the short version, Jacob and Rebecca devised the plan to steal Esau's blessing. And this is where we're going to pick up in scripture in Genesis 27, 19 through 38. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn, and I have done as you have told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac said, Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord, your God, gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son. To know whether or not you are really my son Esau. <clears throat> Jacob went close to his father and Isaac who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him for his hands were hairy like those of his brothers Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked again. He said, are you really my son Esau? I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate and he brought him some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said, to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went out, so he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. My God, may God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mothers bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. 
after Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too had prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please set up for me some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunts a game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him and he will indeed be blessed. When Esau heard his father's word, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and his, said to his father, bless me, me to my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightfully named Jacob? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he has taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept a lot. I think that is an absolutely crazy story. <laughs> and I truthfully have not looked deeply into it since Miss Edna taught it to me in, in child, in like Sunday school. But now looking in it, I can really zoom in on God's faithfulness. And I know that might sound crazy because God's faithfulness, he's stealing a blessing. That's, that doesn't seem like that's what you would get out of these verses. But I think what we need to understand, what we need to see is everyone is doing the wrong thing in these verses. Yet God is still making the right thing happen. He is fulfilling his promises. He is still making everything fall into his plan even though everyone is going against him. Is that not just an amazing testimony of God's mercy and faithfulness to us? Even in doing the wrong thing, when we lie and we steal, God still views us as his children and keeps his promises to us. Even when Jacob has constantly sent he disguised himself. He made himself like the snake in the garden. God still fulfilled his promise. And so right after Jacob steals this blessing, he runs away from his family. He's scared of his brother, and he's scared of his father, and he's scared of what is going to happen. And he knows this curse is coming to his mother, and he, he's scared. So he runs away, and he lives in exile for 20 years. He runs to Mesopotamia, 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 where his uncle Laban lives. And the best way I've heard this described was through the Bible Project app, where it says, the deceiver has finally met his match. Laban is a deceiver just like Jacob. And so they deceive and deceive and deceive each other for 20 years. Whether that be for land or labor or power or wives, they're deceiving just constantly. But this, he's deceiving, Jacob is, he's deceiving while he has a blessing upon him. He still has not changed. He stole the blessing and he's still deceiving. And so we, we see this kind of continue to play out as the deceiver is being deceived and deceiving. Lots of deceiving, <laughs> if you guys didn't catch on. Um, but he's also living out his blessing. He's living plentiful. He's getting married and he's getting blessed with children. And having children is truly 
one of the best blessings of all. Because we are called to be fruitful and to multiply. And so that blessing of children. But these, but these children that are blessings, they're blessings surrounded by curse because everything around him is built in his own will, in his own way. And so everything around him is falling down. But these blessings from God, like his children, are right in the middle of that. And so we'll see that get played out a little more next week as we kind of dig in to the sons of Jacob. But just, it's a blessing surrounded by a curse. Right now, we're seeing Jacob still lying, stealing, and deceiving. Still lying, stealing, and deceiving. Even after God has fulfilled his promise to him and has blessed him. He is greedy, he wants more, and he wants to live the way that he thinks is right for him. But we're going to pick back up in scripture after those 20 years. After those 20 years of deceiving and living in exile, we're going to pick back up there. And we're going to pick back up in a prayer. But I'll, I'll mention something after, but this prayer comes second. And I just want you guys to think of that as we read through this. This prayer is coming second in Jacob's life. So Genesis 32, 9 through 12. It says, Then Jacob prayed, O oh God, my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of your kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed the Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid that he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper, and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So he prays this, this, he's scared. He's praying to God. But what we need to, what happened before this was he heard that Esau was going to come attack him. And so he sends out his armies. He sends out these, out his family and his wives and people ahead of him. And he sends these people out because he's scared. Because he's living in fear. And he goes to God second. He goes to God second. He prays and expects God to deliver him and to be safe and to just be with him while he goes out to go home. But it wasn't his first idea. His first idea was off his will. So go, go, go and protect me. I will send my armies out to protect me. And then I'll pray. And then God, and then God can keep me safe the rest of the way. But after I've already done what I think is best for me to do. And we can see after 20 years of deceiving, he is still not 100% serving the Lord. Nor is he trusting him, believing in his faithfulness. Showing us once again that Jacob is making his own decisions that he thinks is right and trying to live life the way he believes he should be. Live life what he thinks it should be. Not what God has done for him. And then that, that moves us into what I think is one of the most powerful imageries in the Bible. It is Jacob wrestling with God. So we're going to jump into Genesis 32, 22 through 31. And it says this. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabuk. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that the hip was popped out of place. 
as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I'm not letting you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called this place Peniel, saying, it was because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and was living because of his hand. Jacob wrestles with God. He physically wrestles with God. Is that not crazy? He, Jacob has spent his whole life stealing what God wanted to freely give him, not trusting in God or his timing or his plan or what God was wanting to bless him with. And then God meets him where he's at. And this paints the picture of having to wound to heal having to break us down to build us back up in his image. We have strayed so far off that he, he, we often find ourselves, what we feel is rock bottom, but what we need to understand is God's there with us. He's trying to build us back up. He had to break us down because we built our house, we built our lives with things that aren't good for us. We built our lives on not firm foundations, on these blessings that we're stealing, or trying to take, or trying to convince ourselves we have because we're trying to be the best Christians. And in verse 25, it says, God touched. Just touched the hip socket, and it popped out of place. And from my interpretation, based on my research with the Bible project, my takeaway was that this took his blessing of being fruitful and multiplying away. It took his access to abundance through generations away. Now, there's different interpretations on this, but like I said earlier, giving life, being fruitful and multiplying, having children, is one of the biggest blessings we can have. And if that is taken away, what, what is left? You can't. You can only be fruitful, which Jacob has not been. But he cannot multiply. Also in this passage, we see the name change. And that is so important. He goes from Jacob, the heel grower, the deceiver, to Israel, one who struggles with God, and continues to struggle and wrestle with God. We see the shift in his life. And if you read on into the Jacob story, you're going to see how this kind of flips. His whole name changes. It changes his identity. I mean, your name is your identity, and God says, we're changing that. You should no longer be known as the heel grabber or the deceiver. And with this wrestling, and in this passage, I think it was best put by Cooper Peltes, where it says, it's an irresistible force meeting an unmovable object. That irresistible force being God's want and God's need to bless you. God just is pursuing you, and he just wants to bless you, and it's an irresistible force. <clears throat> but we often find ourselves as the unmovable objects. We're not willing to be blessed. We're not willing to let God move in our lives. We find ourselves concreted in not letting God move and then getting upset when he's not showing up in the ways we think he should. And it's shown in the Jacob story over and over and over again. And just we, just like Jacob, sometimes have to get wounded 
to get healed. We have to be wounded by our own sins. We have to, because we're never going to physically wrestle God. But I think we oftentimes spiritually wrestle Him. We're constantly in spiritual warfare. But who, you hear this phrase spiritual warfare, and I think we often think of it as battling the devil or battling bad thoughts and stuff. But who are you battling? Are you battling God right now? Are you battling the blessings he's trying to give you? Are you in the wrong spot of spiritual warfare? Are you fighting the wrong person? So where are you in that? And and the, the biggest thing that I think really, really stood out is God meeting us where we are. God found himself at this river and wrestled, wrestled with Jacob, meeting him at his lowest when he's living in fear, when he's called to go back home after stealing, after being a deceiver. God meets him there. God strikes to heal. And whether in our lives, it, so, like I said, it's never going to be a physical wrestling match in our lives. But some of it can be God closing a door on something that we think we want open. We think that's the way that we're supposed to go. And so we're pushing that door back, saying, no, God, that's, that's where I'm supposed to go. And God's just trying to open another door for you. And just this constant mistrust of God that's been planted in humans from the very beginning when we decided to decipher what is good and evil for ourselves. Jacob was a liar, a stealer, and a deceiver who God has chosen to put in his plan, to put in the Bible, to make him known. And so I think we're, we're all just like Jacob. We're all sinners who God has invited us to be a part of his story and to write his story and to change people's lives with him by our side. So I would just like to invite the worship team up now. So today, I'd like to invite some self-reflection. One, who are you battling? Are you battling God for something you think you deserve? Are you battling and trying to steal this blessing that you think you deserve? Where are you in your spiritual warfare? Two, what are you wrestling God for? Why? Why are we wrestling God? What are we trying to get? What are we trying to receive? Three, what do we need to surrender? What do we need to put in God's hands to believe that he is faithful, to believe that he has a plan for us? What do we need to give him? What do we need to surrender in this moment to let God in? to let him bless us and to let him show us his love. How are we going to put our faith in a God who has never been unfaithful? How are you going to show that? How are you going to show that? How are you going to be in surrender it's right now? Just give up what we need to give up. Give up. So if you'll stand with me today in worship, as we, as our worship team leads these songs, I want it, I want you guys to make a point of surrenderance in your life. Things that you're battling with, things you're struggling with, things you are wrestling God for. I want you to surrender that now. Make it a point right now. <laughs> 